Welcome back. All right, so my continuing look at teams and their off seasons that they've had. I want to talk about Toronto. And as you can see, I put a lot of information on the board. It, it just feels like we do talk about Toronto. And I, I wanted to talk about Toronto in a way that not everybody else is talking about Toronto. That's why I waited till July the 16th to talk about Toronto. So for the Leafs, the one thing that's always been a talking point for me is not the core four as much as just the depth beyond it. So we look at the Florida Panthers who just won the Stanley Cup. Depth was a huge part of how they get there. There was no one player in Florida that if you shut him down, well, you, you win. And with Toronto, it feels like if you shut down one or two players, you win. And that is, I think, the difference between the Leafs and teams that have won the Stanley Cup. You look over the last 10 years of teams that win the Stanley Cup, you have to have that scoring depth. You have to be able to adjust when a top guy's out, right? So when we look at this team, Austin Matthews gets all of the press, and I get it. He had 69 goals, 107 points this past season. Regular season, he's been fantastic, and I'll get into the numbers here. Mitch Marner, for all the negativity around Marner, he was still on around 100-point pace if he played the full season. 69 games, 26 goals, 59 assists, 85 points. 100-point uh, 100 producers, there's not a ton of them in the NHL, even though the scoring has gone up in the, around the league. Uh, and so Marner's an important player to them. Now there's Matthew Nyes, who didn't quite have the rookie season, I think some had hoped. 15 goals, 20 assists, 35 points is still good for a rookie. I don't know how much upside there is. I think Nyes can reach 20 goals. I don't know how many more than that, though. And then on the second line, you have Bobby McMahon, who really busts his tail every night. 15 goals, 9 assists, 24 points in 56 games. Uh, John Tavares, it was a drop. And it was a drop in his production that at this stage of the game, I don't know if we can expect his production to go back up. 29 goals, 36 assists for 65 points, which hurts. Uh, but when you look at the scoring on this team, scoring wasn't really the problem. So Tavares dropping off scoring-wise, not as much of a problem as it otherwise would be because William Nylander had 40 goals, 58 assists for 98 points in 82 games. So you've got Matthews over 100 points, Nylander near 100 points, and Marner producing at 100-point pace, again, if he'd played the entire season. But then you get into the rest. Now, Holmberg's a hard worker. Seven goals, 10 assists, those 17 points, 54 games. I think you want more goals. Max Domi, a lot of, I mean, the points totals are good, but only nine goals. You have nine, goal, nine goals, 38 assists, 47 points. And then Callie Yarncroke played 52 games, 10 goals, 11 assists, 21 points. So that means their third line, that's 26 goals between these three players. Now, obviously, they didn't play the full 82 games, either of the wingers, but it's still, this is a team that needs to have more depth scoring. So the fact that Robertson apparently wants out should be frustrating because Robertson has that goal-scoring talent. And if he goes somewhere else, I do think he could absolutely hit the ground running. Uh, let's say Robertson went to a team like Chicago or San Jose, a young team that could give him a lot of ice time. Uh, he, he, could, he could be quite good. Uh, then you get to the blue line, and this is where the great debate comes in, right? You have Morgan Riley, 7 goals, 51 assists, 58 points in 72 games. Again, coming back to the most recent Stanley Cup champion, Florida Panthers, they have some very good blue liners, and Oliver ekman Larson gets added by Toronto after winning that Stanley Cup in Florida. He had 32 points, 9 of those goals, 23 of those assists in 80 games. ekman Larson bounced back from a rough time in Vancouver, and so the question then becomes, so in Florida, were they able to make ekman Larson look like not necessarily the old Ekman Larson during his peak with Arizona, but a much more effective player. Um, and it, are his weaknesses that showed up in Vancouver going to show up in Toronto? Then there's Tanev. 75 games, 2 goals, 17 assists, 19 points. But Tanev's 34, blocks a ton of shots. Eventually the body breaks down. And I've seen all the, well, they'll just put him on LTIR for years 5 and 6. Okay, but that's assuming he gets through the next 4 years without major injuries. Again... He shot blocks a ton. Uh, he doesn't miss as many games as he did, say, three, four years ago. But he still does miss his share of games. Uh, and then there's Lilligren. 55 games, 3 goals, 20 assists, 23 points. I think now he gets a real opportunity to play every game and play a ton. And Lilligren has some offensive upside, I think, still to his game. But the question I have when I look at this top four is, is this a top four that we look at and say, this is a team that, you know, could very well win the Stanley Cup. 
And I, I, I don't know. I don't think so. Personally, just looking at it, I don't see a blue line there that goes to the Stanley Cup. Now, the question mark I have is you have Wool, who had a record of 12-11-1 last season, 907 save percentage. You have Stolars. I love Stolars. 16-7-2, 925 save percentage this past season in Florida. Stolars has never been a starter, and we don't know whether or not Wool is going to be a really, really good starter for the Toronto Maple Leafs. We have some idea, right? And they signed him to the contract extension, so they believe in him. But we'll see. Because, again, uh, you had Bobrovsky in Florida the year before you had Aiden Hill in, in Vegas. Aiden Hill got on a heater there, uh, but Bobrovsky, we know how good he is. And I, I don't know if Toronto's had that starting goaltender for a playoff run. So, again, uh, here's your, your Bertuzzi signing with the Hawks, Robertson's contract issues, and uh, and, and again, you know, potentially wanting a trade just to make sure I didn't forget because I'm old. Uh, but the wins for this team since 2016, 2017, the beginning of the Austin Matthews era. Freddie Anderson still leads with 149. He had 10 in the playoffs in total. Uh, Jack Campbell, 51 wins during the regular season, six in the playoffs. Sam Sonoff, 50 wins in the regular season, five in the playoffs. Wool, 21 wins during the regular season, three in the playoffs. McElhinney's had 17 wins, Matt Murray 14 wins, Mrazek 12 wins, uh, Jones and Shalgren with 11, and Hutchinson with 10. A lot of goaltenders. And not a goaltender I see there that I say that's that's a cup winner, other than the fact that Murray won back-to-back -back cups with Pittsburgh, but he's no longer that goaltender, right? Um, and now he's still there. We'll see if he gets into some games this year. But in all honesty, it's going to probably be Wall and Stolarz the whole season, unless something happens to one of them getting hurt. Uh, and then maybe Matt Murray gets that chance. Now, they don't have any cap space, which makes it tough when you've got free agents to sign. $955,333. And the big four make a lot of money, right? Uh, Matthews cap hits $13.25 million until 2028. Uh, Nylander, $11.5 million until 2032. Tavares and Marner are both on expiring contracts. Tavares, $11 million cap hit for the one more year. Marner, a $10.9 million cap hit for one more year. And again, Marner's still producing at 100 points per, per season, at least at that rate. He's probably going to get at least that much on the next contract. I don't see the cap hit dropping for Marner on his next contract. Tavares, it probably does. So if Tavares decides to stick around in Toronto, I would say he can probably have that. Probably get it down to a five and a half million dollar cap hit, which would help the team in other areas. The problem is, if Tavares is a declining asset at that point, now you're looking for somebody else to be that number two center. Is it going to be Domi? There's the possibility Domi ends up on the second line, Tavares ends up on the third line sooner rather than later. Uh, and Tavares definitely, there's more goals there than there is with Domi. Maybe that's a better matchup. Uh, maybe Domi with Nylander and McMahon could work. We'll see. But uh, yeah, there's some question marks there when you're looking at the Leafs. So one question too is, when are they going to officially sign Hawk and Paw? Hawk and Paw is a physical blue liner. He's a big blue liner, but he's, he's third pairing at this point in time in his career. And for Toronto, a team that desperately, you know, is trying to repair what is seen as that weakness, which is the blue line, which the numbers would tell you was this past season, right? Um, is Hawk and Paw going to be part of this team or not? Uh, and then there becomes the question of, as well that everybody speculates on about whether or not they're going to trade a core player. They need depth. This is a team that needs scoring depth. They need to be able to roll three scoring lines. And I don't know that they've ever really truly had that over the last eight years. Now, keep in mind, too, that Dewar is a restricted free agent as well as Robertson. So that's two signings and the fact they have less than a million dollars in cap space. Again, and on Puckpedia, they're including Hawk and Paw. So without Hawk and Paw, you have uh, almost two and I guess almost two and a half million dollars in cap space. But then you need to sign somebody else in place of Hawk and Paw because you're still looking for that depth on the blue line. So if Brad Tree Living doesn't sign that contract with with Hawk and Paw, he's going to need to go out and find somebody else, right? Because he's still acknowledging he needs something on the blue line. So looking at just the trending, trending part of things. Uh, in terms of since 2016-2017, which was Matthew's first year, they finished 14th in the league. Then they were 7th, they were 8th, 13th in 2019-2020. Then 6th, 4th, 5th, and this past season they were 10th. So to me, they're trending in the other direction. 
this is a team that um, they they're definitely in my mind, anyways. They're they're trending down a little bit, and I don't know if the moves that they've made here are going to be enough to keep them up towards the top of their division. Even though we know Boston could very well fall off, uh, Florida may have a hard time following up what they did this past season. Might have the cup hangover in October, November. It's tough to get up for those games early in the season after the intensity of those games in June. But we'll see. Now, when we look at goals four, uh, they've been top 10 every single year with Matthews there. They haven't been first, but they've been third or second three times, including this past season. So in goal scoring in the National Hockey League, they've been mostly top five, fifth, third, fourth, second, sixth, second, ninth, and second. So the goal scoring hasn't been a problem for Toronto in the regular season. Postseason absolutely has been. Uh, but the, the defensive side of things, 22nd that first year with Matthews, then 12th, 20th, 25th, 7th in 2020, 2021, uh, 19th the following season, 7th in 2022, 2023, and then 21st this season. So this is a team that desperately needs to get the goals against down. But again, even though the scoring has been fine overall, it just feels like in pl at playoff time, uh, there's an issue with the depth. So again, looking from 2016-17 till now, Matthews is 8th in the entire league with 649 points. He is 1st in goals over that time period with 368 goals. Uh, Marner is 10th in the, in the National Hockey League over that time with 639 points. He is 6th in assists with 445. So again, if the Leafs decided, well, we'll make Marner available, teams will call. But at that $10.9 million cap hit, I don't know how many teams can absorb majority of it, much less all of it, right? So that's the tricky part. Uh, Tavares has been 19th in scoring around the NHL with 569 points over that time period and 12th in goals with 249. So despite a lot of the, the knocks that Tavares takes, he's been a pretty strong producer for them up until this past season. And even now, I mean, 30 goals is still, you know, almost, well, 29 goals, almost 30 goals. Uh, Tavares has been good. Now, in terms of points per game, Matthews has been ninth in the National Hockey League at 1.15. Marner, 12th at 1.15. Then you have Tavares at 0 0.95 and Nylander at 0 0.89. But as you can see, Nylander's trending up scoring-wise. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is these guys are in their mid-20s. This is when usually guys are in their prime and they really start to hit their stride, especially come playoff time, we shall see. Because in the playoffs, this has been a struggle. So we're talking about, you know, well above a point per game, but not in the playoffs. Marner's been their most productive forward during this run, 0 0.88 points per game. Matthews is right there behind him at 0 0.87 points per game. Riley, or O'Reilly, Ryan O'Reilly, when he came in as a, a rental, he had 0 0.82 points per game in the short run he had as a Leaf. Uh, Nylander, 0 0.8. And then Morgan Riley at 0 0.7. Galchenyuk at 0 0.67. Tavares, Tavares at 0 0.63. That, I will agree with people, you want more from Tavares than that over that run. Uh, Domi, 0 0.57. The same as Bertuzzi. And Thomas Plakanitz. So, yeah, there's a blast from the past. Uh, James Van Riemsdyk, 0 0.54, and then Nyes, Kadri, Marlowe, and Eric Gustafson all at 0 0.5 points per game. They don't get the production when they need it. Too many guys have come and gone, and it, it feels like we've seen legend after legend come through this roster, whether it was Spezza, Marlowe, Thornton, O'Reilly, I would qualify in that category too. And they're just, they're not able to, to get over that hump. So, so the question mark I have with Toronto is, kind of the same one we've had for a while now is the depth going to be enough to get them over the top we know we know that teams shut down their top scorers in the playoffs but that's the problem they don't have anybody outside those top scorers at least traditionally haven't during this run who can hurt you when the when the top scorers are shut down and so they've been pushed aside in the first round seven out of these eight years and pushed aside in the second round that eighth year so to me, this is why when, when I was doing my projection of the standings, I dropped the Leafs down a little bit lower than Leaf fans I think we're happy with because I just I don't know that this blue line's necessarily a lot better. You need Tanev to be healthy and you need Ekman Larson to play in Toronto the way he did in Florida. And then I do have my doubts with the goaltending tandem because you have two goaltenders who haven't really been tested as starters with a starter's workload in the NHL. And so... 
there are a lot of question marks for a Toronto team uh, in an East where it feels like there's some really stacked teams. There's some very balanced teams. And, and I don't know how Toronto is going to be able to counter that. Maybe they do. Maybe this is the year. But one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, they've only been as high as fourth once in this run. And, and as I've mentioned in, in recent videos where I've talked about cup champs, you've got to be consistently towards the top of the league to have that, that, that status as a contender and be able to follow through as a contender. Uh, this is a team that has flirted with being a contender, but in the playoffs, they just haven't quite been there. Uh, I know people will complain about the division they're in and how much more difficult it is, but eventually you have to beat the good teams anyways. And there are no easy matchups in the first round of the playoffs. There just aren't any. I'm waiting because people are going to mention the Capitals, so I'll just wait a moment there. But the reality is there there are no easy matchups. And I, I do think that for Toronto... They're not an easy out by any stretch. How many of these series have they lost where it goes all the way to the full seven games? But in that seventh game, the star players seem to get shut out and they're not able to get over the hump otherwise. But let me know your thoughts in the comment section below as always. Is this the year that we will see Toronto? Year nine for the Matthews era. Will this be the year that Toronto finally gets over that hump come playoff time? What else do they need? If they do sign Hawk and Paw, does he slot in on that third pairing? Does that free up somebody else to potentially, potentially be traded? Do they trade Robertson? What do you think is going to happen? And do you think Marner and Tavares both finish this upcoming season as Leafs? Let me know your thoughts. Hit like and subscribe if you've not done so already. Thank you guys so much for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.